for our next session, we have two distinguished speakers from very different walks of life. And I'm excited to introduce both of them. One of these speakers is as famous in the entertainment world as he is visionary. And on the surface, he may seem removed from the enterprise tech scene. But as you're likely to discover over the next 30 minutes or so, his relentlessly analytical approach to mass audience targeting is one that many industries and CIOs can learn from. I'm talking, of course, about Steve Stout, an entertainment industry media mogul and now an advertising guru. During his days in the music industry, he managed the careers and grew the fan bases of iconic artists such as Will Smith, Nas, and Mary J. Blige. In 2004, he launched his brand marketing company, Translation, based on Steve's belief that Fortune 500 companies were missing out on an opportunity to create a deeper connection with their end customers, a connection rooted in the idea that a consumer's demographic was a little less important than their psychographic. And translation helps major brands such as the NBA, Allstate Insurance, and McDonald's decipher that consumer psychographic through the power of data. Joining Steve in this exchange will be George Matthews, who is president and chief operating officer of analytics company Alterix, where he oversees marketing, products, and strategy for the company. Alterix, as many of you probably know, is a key disruptor in the analytics space and enjoys some of the highest customer success rates in the industry. Prior to joining Alterix in 2011, George was group vice president and general manager for BI at SAP Business Objects. And as if the tech credentials weren't enough already, George also has a degree in neurobiology and behavior. And last, but maybe not the least, as a Long Island native, I'm told by trusted, anonymous but trusted sources, that George knows a thing or two about hip hop, but we'll, we'll find out soon. George will talk about how to influence customer behavior with the power of analytics, uh, together with Steve, and whether the customers you as CIO serve are employees, suppliers, partners, or just the end buyers of your products and services, I think you're all in for some eye-opening takeaways. Um, we have a short video to give you a snapshot of just that. And as the video is pulling up, I'd like to invite Steve and George uh, to please come up on the stage. Thank you. the founder and chief executive of Translation. He's a former record label executive. And also the author of a new book, The Tanning of America. A man with boundless passion and energy. But the advertising executive of the year? An author? I don't understand. Mr. Steve Stout is yes. here. Yes, yes. There's a generation that grew up and said, we're gonna find what we have in common rather than find what we have different. There's a very strong thing that brought these people together. There's very few things that can bring these people together. It was tanning. It was a mental complexion that felt very similar. We help bring global culture together. That's what I wanted to get out there, and that's what this project was for. And I said, I'm going to use the same premise that hip-hop used to break down uh, boundaries. I'm going to bring that into the advertising business. But I can't say that what you're going to see from me 10 years from now is what you will make sense today. So we, we thought we would spend a little bit of time talking about how the consumer has changed quite a bit. And Steve, you've actually lived through this in the last, uh, call it, two decades or so. So you talk about the tanning of America. Tell uh, us a little bit more about what you mean by this idea of the tanning of American, you know. So, <clears throat> just to give you a little background, the, the videos up there were a lot of commercial work that we've done as an advertising agency for brands such as uh, McDonald's. We launched I'm Loving It, uh, came up with I'm Loving It, to uh, um, the NBA, State Farm, um, uh, now the NFL, Apple Music, are the brands that we work with. And I started my career in the music business. I started running record companies. I started as a manager. I became the head of black music at uh, Sony and then the executive vice president and president of 
of Interscope Records, a division of Universal. Now, the whole notion about the president of black music, I just want to, because I've seen everybody's face, like, what, what does that mean? Well, I'll tell you what that means, because it's very important, and it ties into this conversation. You just got to stay with me for the journey. There was a period in time in which these demographics had to be put in these boxes, and it were particularly set so that media could be purchased against certain radio stations, against certain targeting. So having a black music division was awesome because you take all these stations that primarily were in African-American neighborhoods, and they would play music that was made by African-Americans, and that was considered black music. Mm -hmm. So that you could run in by media against it if you wanted to target black people. So I remember specifically in, let's call it 1998, Beyonce came and Destiny's Child. It was at Sony and no one knew what department to put her in. <laughs> but that actually was because the world was shifting quickly. And this whole notion of, that's an African-American artist, so therefore that has to play in black, that's not even true. That's not even true. So when we start talking about targeting and we start talking about information and data and we leave out culture, you don't see these things happening before they happen. You just, all of a sudden, you run into that quandary. One of the things I had to tell my clients, I say to them all the time when they, some of them still have their foot stuck in the old economics, in the old way of media targeting. And I asked them, I will do whatever you ask, but you first have to show me the black section of Facebook. <laughs> well, there's no such thing. Well then, when you look at it and you pay special attention to it, you go into, you go into a Walmart, you go into a Target, there's a black beauty section. <laughs> so if you're a young 16 year old girl, and you love the way Beyonce or Rihanna wears her hair, you're completely confused. Because you expect it to be in alphabetical order. But there's a special section that you have to sneak into because that's the African-American beauty section and you're a young Jewish girl trying to get your hair products to look like Rihanna. And we see this, this is rampant in the industry. These are not small bespoke examples. These are the examples that lead to tons of opportunities that we get paid very well to help brands craft, to capture, engage, and sort of disrupt that way of thinking. So Steve, take us back to like the late 80s, early 90s. I was a product of that era. And- You look I, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm tr it's, startup life has treated me well. So if you, if you look at this space uh, that occurred during that moment, like I went away to college, and I was listening to, you know, Erasure and Anything Box, and then I came out right a few years in, and the taste of even what I listened to, right, had changed. Yeah. N.W.A., yeah. you know, Public Enemy. Yeah. Like, what happened in that period that, you know, shifted, and and how do corporations like start to understand those things when there's no predictive indicator, you know, that tells us, hey, this. This, this phenomenon and culture is happening. How, how, do you, how do you react? How do you know these things? One of the biggest opportunities that we spend a lot of time on at Translation is working on putting together some measurement of cultural impact. Because unfortunately, culture never gets the credit it deserves. You talk about technology, you talk about storytelling, but you leave out the cultural piece. The cultural piece is a very big component on how to see what's happening next. It's subculture becomes mainstream culture and mainstream culture becomes something that we all, it's our job to understand what's going on, how to engage into, in it, and also to see it coming. So when you start talking about this music, it all goes back to like gentrification. So when primarily African-Americans were living in the city, they were living in the city and white people were living in the suburbs, right? Let's just, let's just be uh, very Trumpish for a second. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll talk about Trump in a second. But, yeah, just, but let's yeah, just do yeah, it just yeah, to yeah. make, yeah. right? Binary, like, thing. So what happened was, <laughs> it, 
it was really easy to target when that was the case. But when you, coming out of the 70s, going into the 80s, suburbia started to move back towards the city. So the same radio stations that used to be just black radio stations, all of a sudden started, these Caucasian kids started hearing this music. And it really got to a sort of loud pitch with MTV and MTV raps. Then all of a sudden you got all these kids coming home at three o'clock and they're like, man, I like NWA. Mm -hmm. Who's Bon Jovi? <laughs> you know, and that literally started to take place because, you know, and in the beginning of it, when I was in the business, you'd see these kids and they would be like, white kid from Connecticut, I, I live in New York, and they'd come down to the clubs and they'd get like really bad names, right? Wigger, or they'd just call them something, like a white kid trying to be black. Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, that's just a white kid who grew up on Run DMC. Like that's all, it, that's all it was. But yet society has to put people in these boxes and this makes perfect sense if you do not have an understanding on culture and subculture and paying attention to it so that you can be predictive that this is gonna happen. Because of this gentrification and relocation, look, it's the same, the reason why we love, all love pizza. We were exposed to it in our neighborhoods. It's, music is the same thing. It's, 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 it's part of what exposes you. It's part of what leads to your decision making. If we, so we have some of the leading CIOs in the audience That's here. That's awesome. This is great. And Rami, so we, this is a great room. Thank you for having me. So, so when you think about the, uh, the folks that are in this audience and we think about this cultural shift, like what happens when corporate America misses these shifts? What happened to Kodak? It's what happens to all of the companies that miss it. You miss it. You, you got, you, you, it's like the CIO has to be like the best offensive lineman in the league. You got to block for your companies. You have to see what's coming. You have to see the blitz. You have to understand where it's coming from so that you can inform everybody what we need to do, what, how we need to, where's the new information coming from and how we need to protect our ongoing business and also be able to look forward at future businesses and opportunities. That's the job. When you don't do that, We've seen it over and over and again without, throughout our careers, whether you're a startup or whether you're a seasoned CIO, companies that you worked at that just fell by the wayside because some, CI, some CEO got stuck in remember the time when it used to be like this. And because he got, fell in love with that so much, he forgot what was going on. Kodak had every single right. They owned memories. The fact that they decided that memories couldn't be digital was the death of that company. Very simple. And that's what happens to every company that decides that they want to be stoic in the past and not understand what's happening in the future. And you will see that happen in the music business in the next 18 months. That business will absolutely blow up. The stress fractures are there. Exact same thing. Legacy economics, legacy labyrinth contracts, an artist looking to be free because they can go direct to consumer. There's no more pressing plants. There's no more guys trying to set up end caps. There's no more distribution issues. It is perfect for disruption and the artists will all be on their own labels because they should not be signed to Columbia or anything else because none of those guys do anything that they can no longer do from their, on their own. So let's talk a little bit, a little bit about analytics. I mean, I'm, I'm a bit of an analytics guy for the last at least decade and change. Uh, you certainly have applied some analytics in terms of how you think about both behavioral and psychographic opportunities that occur in the market. Where do you think it's best applied, particularly for consumer choice decision making, and where can you go off the rails? And I'll also give some examples as well. Okay. Let's start with you, Steve. You know, I spent time with uh, uh, Reed Hastings, and I asked him a couple questions that I, as an entrepreneur, it, it really gave me a lot of confidence that I was doing it right. My question was very simply, and then I'll get to the analytics part of it. Sure. Okay. You start sending these red envelopes to people's homes. It's working. It's just a matter of time that you must expect every night as you're raising money that somebody at Blockbuster organization is gonna go, we have all these physical brick and mortar places. Why don't we just deliver it to people's homes and we can get it there quicker? Like, forget those red envelopes. We know people like this red envelope. They, we know they like it coming to them. We have distribution hubs in every neighborhood. 
Why don't we just do it? I'm like, how did you sleep at night knowing as a startup that that can happen to you if one guy makes that decision in a board meeting? He bet that the old guard will get stuck in the old guard way. Then he decided, rather than let somebody else as a startup do it to me, I'm going to do it to myself. And I'm going to disrupt myself because I'm reading the analytics. And in fact, I'm watching broadband penetration. So I'm going to start delivering it through streaming. And I'm like, you're delivering it through streaming, but everybody's wheel is spinning. You're not getting it. You can't see the movie. It's taking too long to load. He goes, Wayne Gretzky said, you don't ski where the puck is, you ski where the puck's going to be. And like, with that decision, now, of course, you have all the catalog rights of the studio heads. They give you Rocky 1, 2, 3, and 4, and all the other movies. And you start looking at the patterns, the viewing patterns, where people stop the movie, where they resume it, what movies they're watching. And you take that data, and then you start to use that data in service to the consumer by creating a show like House of Cards, like Orange is the New Black. That was all informed. And because you have those decisions, you can pay more, you can be more accurate, because you're using the data in service to the customer. And I think that's the best use of it. And um, that use case, I always benchmark when someone gives me an idea about data and analytics, I benchmark against sort of that Netflix model because using data and analytics in service to the consumer so it doesn't feel like creepy Big Brother stuff is where you need to be. Yeah, so a great example. And when you think about that transition that Netflix made to really understand the penetration of broadband and shifting from you know, the ownership of these red envelopes to really driving the digital delivery of video to the world. I mean, it's an amazing thing that they disrupted themselves. One of the examples that you and I were talking about a few weeks back when we were kind of getting ready for the session was um, some of the data analytics that's occurring, particularly inside of multi-channel retail, right? And we were covering a lot of the ground that a joint customer of ours, Belk, underwent, right? So Belk, for those of you who don't know, is one of the leading retailers in the sort of South, right? They've historically had a very strong presence in the South. A lot of their analytic models, interestingly, were built about 40 years ago, right? And uh, those, those models were built in a way to describe about 12 major segments that Belk went after. And those segments were where they targeted, where they put the flyers out, where they put promotional insertions in, and that's the way Belk did business. But there's been this, um, hypothesis inside of Belk's business that there was additional clusters, there's new segments that are emerging that you know, weren't available even 40 years ago. And we talked about this, right? Because if we think about the analysis that Altrix had done with Belk about three years ago, we found the 13th and 14th segment of Belk's customer audience. And interestingly, it was middle class African Americans that were aspirationally you know, in a whole different category than that in, in initial segment um, segmentation model sort of played out itself out 30, 40 years ago. When you have those shifts, like where do you see uh, analytics being applied to find those da data points? And then how do you use sort of the cultural sort of input to reaffirm or, or you know, disagree yeah. with, it, with, with, with the data, what the data is telling you? I can tell you from my experience um, in writing the book, The Tanning of America, um, the book speaks specifically about the mental complexion, tanning this mental complexion of different cultures coming together, forming this sort of shared ways of seeing the world. And uh, in, the, in the process of gathering information, I went to the, to the Census Bureau. And I got there and I met the head of the Census Bureau and he was giving me these myth busters. And one of the myth busters were two in every seven marriages were interracial. And that doesn't include dating or sex or anything. That's just like full on, right? <laughs> Certain segments, it was actually 50%. 
93% of Hispanics under the age of 19 were actually born in America. You see, Belk and other multi-channel retailers don't understand the implications of any of that. They don't understand the implications in the shifts in beauty. When I was growing up, I was a kid in 1988, and I'm going to be very direct here. I was the old boy, high school. I had a girlfriend. She was flat, had a flat stomach, and had a very round derriere. And the guys in 1988 said, man, she's fat. And I'm like, she's a flat stomach. She's not fat. But that was the era of blonde, bosom. Like, so that was the idea of beauty. As we know, 25 years later, ass is the new breast. <laughs> and thin lips have now become big lips. How does Belk respond to that? Jeans, beauty, beauty products you carry? All of these things in these shifts have long tail implications that these retailers have no idea what they mean. And unless you are on the front end of changing that, and understanding that and really reading those tea leaves through analytics that are predictive, through having cultural insight and being able to measure it and understand it and being lockstep with it, you would never even understand what I'm talking about. And I think those things are the subtle shifts that become huge shifts in why retailers fail to capture the imagination of the next generation shopper. So we'll talk about the elections for fun. Since you've mentioned Trump. wherever you want to go, so so uh, we're 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 going to have a little bit of fun in this section. So so we'll start with the the coalition that Obama put together in 08 and, and 12. All right. So so clearly the electorate uh, just responded to that that coalition and voted in kind for at least the last two elections. How do you think it's going to play out next week? I've got some data on this, by the way. So I'm just putting Steve on the spot. Yeah. Just, just for fun. I think it's going to play out. I think, I think Hillary's going to win, and everybody's going to be sort of like uh, bittersweet um, because I think it's just you know as we as you hear, popular opinion is that you know there's no really great candidate, um, but she's the best of, of the what choices. we have of the yeah. choices, and um, you know these things run in cycles, you know. Jimmy Carter was such a terrible president that a Democrat couldn't get the first base for, for, for at least 16 cycles, years because yeah, yeah. of how terrible he ran that office. And since 1981, we've had a Bush or a Clinton. So, I mean, like, these things, right, whether it's George Bush Sr. as vice president to the father to the uh, president, like, They've been in office, and I don't think people have been happy about what's come out of it at all. So if it was up to everybody, they wouldn't take either of these people because they want new and different. And that's actually the opportunity that Trump has that's sort of scary, that everything else, you, you kind of know what it's going to be. And if you sit on the outside of what it's been, then you're like, I don't want to take part in this. I, I would never, uh, uh, I would, I'm just going to vote for something different that's gonna help change my outcome because I already know what it's been. But I think there's still enough people um, that's gonna vote for Hillary uh, uh, for her to pull through. The, I, I, I talk very direct and um, I hope you guys got something from this. When I was in the music business, we, Eminem was one of my artists. And if it was a top rap record, it would sell five million copies. I mean, if it was big, six million, seven million. Eminem comes out, he sells 30 million records. Now, what the analytics told us was, where are these zip codes that they're buying rap music? Mm -hmm. But where he was selling, but he stood in front of a trailer park, talked about hating his mom, spoke about things that were so not part of the art form. But he was speaking to poor white people. Up. Poor white people don't even have an Al Sharpton. They don't even have an, uh, uh, a Jesse Jackson. 
Nobody deals with poor white people. And when Eminem started selling to poor white people, it was a big, we never understood how he was touching them. And when I seen what Trump started, because of what I learned in the music business, I'm like, this guy is the, he's speaking to those same people. The same disenfranchised people who nobody even cares about and does anything for. You, you know, Steve, we, we actually have a bit of data on this because um, Altrex has been working with both sides of the political spectrum, both the RNC and DNC. And what's really interesting, and we'll, we'll put, we have the app up here. You can actually go to altrex.com forward slash election. And type this is in. not fair. If I, if I would have known, I had some slides too, man. No, no, no. I got no, slides. This is, <laughs> not, slides. This is, this is like a well, this live is application, I could have this. Right? I could have put so. Eminem's face and Trump's face, <laughs> the American the flag. I could have played you had the video. eight miles. I got to at least have like something up here, right? <laughs> to keep up with the man. So. Yeah. So, so, so what Steve actually called out is actually quite fascinating, right? Because in this election cycle, there's a massive crossover effect that we don't quite understand yet, right? And so one of the pieces of the crossover is white Republican female married voters that there is no effing way they're going to vote for Trump, right? The flip side is actually just as incredible, right? Which Steve called out, which is the white male high school educated voter that no way he's gonna vote for Hillary, right? And so this crossover effect has some really interesting phenomena. So let's actually look at the data surrounding this. So Anise, you wanna type in a few addresses and let's see kind of, uh, okay, that's uh, your hometown where you grew up in Georgia, right? So let's look at America's Georgia. So what we're doing here um, by way of background is we're taking the SurveyMonkey data that came before and after the election cycle and bringing it together with 130 million households in the US and mapping what the demographic, firmographic records are basically telling us about their voter patterns and then projecting that to the 130 million households in the country. And so, and then we can actually do this at a hyper local level. We can search for an address, we can search for a zip code. And so go back uh, to the previous screen there. So we can actually see now, what that city uh, or town is going to vote like, and we see where the dividing line between blue and red is, and then let's go ahead and so, so at least for that particular uh, location, it's going to be about 60% towards Hillary, about 37% towards Trump. Let's actually flip over and look at the national map just for a second. So this is what the national map plays out to be. No surprise, a lot of the populace is on the two coasts where you see the blue and then you see a sea of red right in the middle. Just scroll up a little bit and we'll see what the, uh, the view looks like, at least as of last week. So this is before the email scandal, right? So we, we, we don't know how that's gonna play out, but about 49% going towards Hillary and about 45% going towards Trump. And so if you look at you know, this, this cycle, the data is telling us one thing, but to your point, there could be a whole different calculus that we don't understand because there's no voice for this disenfranchised audience. The, uh, it's a good setup, Steve. Well, it's a good setup, but the, 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 the most important part of this that I hope we all learned um, is that no matter who gets elected, we have a huge problem. Yep. I mean, this, that's a huge problem. The fact that it's that split that extreme point of view. The fact that that extreme point of view even has traction is a lead indicator that we have a lot of work to do. Um, and that's what, I've got, that's what I've got out of this whole experience, is that I, I wrote the book, The Tanning of America, and every time I see statements about, um, I believe that the next generation, because of access to information, that there was a, a better sense of understanding one another, a better s sense of coming together. And, and it wasn't based off a of color. It was based off a of shared value. So if I'm, I'm African-American and you're Spanish and you like skateboarding, we like skateboarding. We don't like that. We like that. And that's where you want it to be. Like we cluster based off of values. But you start seeing some of this outlying behavior and you realize no matter how far we've come, we have a lot. So is technology, in your view, accelerating that dislocation or bringing us back together? 
I think, you know, in the beginning, I thought, like, access to information and being able to learn about somebody else's culture through searching it, seeing pictures, all of the things that you get, uh, uh, videos, that's one thing. But then you get, this, at the same time, you have people using technology to spread hate. Mm -hmm. You know, so I felt like the initial first run of it was all good that we were finding ways to, to come together. And then it's an open platform where people started util utilizing it for bad. And um, so, you know, I have a mixed point of view on it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I still think it's the right thing to do and people should be entitled to, to, to their opinion. I just feel like we, as a country, um, have to, when you leave people, everywhere you go in disenfranchised places, when you see that, you see poverty, you feel like people don't care, no one's looking out for them, you see disruption, you see problems, you see anarchy, and you see guys that can come in and turn that into, you know, an army of bad. And that's, what, that's, all, that's all we're seeing. That's, that's all this is. And we see it all around the world. Um, so this is not shocking um, that it's happening. It's just alarming that it's happening in 2016 in America. So what's the one thing that the technology leaders in this room should take away from these last two decades of profound change that we've undergone, as well as the next decade that's ahead of us? Well, you know, one of the quotes I heard um, that it's never been this fast and it'll never be this slow again. Um, and that's, that's just a true, that's a true statement, um, that as fast as we think it is, this is the slowest it'll ever be. And um, we have to scale up. We have to be very uh, cognizant of the responsibility that we have in this room um, to do good for the world, as well as do good for our respective businesses, for our families. Um, that's, that's what I gather uh, uh, from this time. One of the things that, you know, being at SAP for the time I was there and then coming to Altrix, about five years ago I was in Japan for SAP and it was interesting to walk into a factory where literally you can bring the raw materials into this factory. It was a robot, a robotics factory. And you, you, you bring the raw materials into the factory. The factory runs at 130 degrees Fahrenheit. For 30 days, you just close the doors, and out on the other side comes robots. Like literally, robots were building robots um, five years ago. And so, so when you talk about that disenfranchisement that's there, it's almost like we haven't even helped skill up and really enable the people that you know would translate from, say, for instance, the blue-collar work of this last generation to what could be, you know, real skills for this current one. And maybe that is some of the responsibility of not only the folks in this room, but of government, yeah. to really be able to provide those capabilities. And to your point, like whoever wins the election, they have a hard road ahead of them. Yeah. All right, good. Well, uh, thank you for the time. And uh, I was happy to warm be round here. of applause for Steve. <laughs>